Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Wood. I work for the NHS Confederation, and welcome to the webinar uh, on local growth and the changing innovation landscape. I'm here with Andrew from the Smart Specialisation Hub. Andrew, do you want to introduce yourself in a bit of background? Yeah, certainly. Um, I'm Andrew Bassey McGowan. I'm the Policy Manager of the Smart Specialisation Hub, uh, which is a body co-delivered by the National Centre for Universities and Business and the Knowledge Transfer Network. Um, I'll speak a little bit more about our work later on, but essentially we uh, are sort of a place-based innovation um, think tank and advisory group. Thanks, Andrew. My name is Michael Wood. I work for the NHS Confederation, which is a membership organisation for NHS uh, trusts, CCGs, mental health trusts, and the independent sector. Uh, and we cover not just England, but, uh, but the wider UK. And my role is as local growth advisor is to try and help NHS colleagues understand the changing local growth context, what it means for them, and how to best influence. Very quickly, in terms of logistics, uh, if you would like to ask any questions at any point, please use uh, the chat function on the webinar. Uh, we will either respond at the time or, or at the end of the webinar. Uh, this has been recorded, so we will make available the slides and the recording afterwards. And the nature of this webinar series, but particularly the first one, uh, Andrew, is that this is incredibly informal. And, and so as we go through, you know, we will be talking about some of the linked and associated areas and, you know, we might jump between slides. But I think we're just trying to, in this first webinar, get the basics understood about who we are, why we, why we work in this field, and how some of what can often appear isolated issues all link together. So this will be incredibly informal. In terms of the first slide then, why have we chosen local growth and innovation? Well, what we're seeing now is a local growth agenda which is rapidly changing, I think, the context in which we in public service provision, uh, particularly in England, operate. Uh, what we're seeing as well is, is a sense of the place, which perhaps we always thought place was rather theoretical uh, in the past. We're now seeing a real sense of place and what that means. And, and that can be quite challenging in a centralized culture. When, when we have to, uh, when we have to now understand what what happens across sectors in, in a given area from that bottom up perspective, we've chosen innovation because it's it's a particular, a particularly strong theme of the local growth agenda, and because it's incredibly important to the NHS, and we've seen you know a raft of national. Uh, innovation strategies in the NHS. We now have bodies such as academic health science networks working on a regional basis. And I know Andrew's going to touch on the other side of that fence, I suppose, Andrew, in terms of his work with LEPS, uh, you know, and how they come together. And I think that brings me on to the last point on this slide, really, which is actually, as we are understanding the place, and as we are understanding how we need to work together as institutions, we bring in this concept of the anchor institutions, which uh, it, you know it, it is that perception that uh, my place will evolve and change, and particularly businesses will come and go. But your hospital, your university, your town hall, you're fixed. You are an anchor institution. You have a responsibility and a key role economically in that in that local area. So I think that's my perception start of a ten of these issues, Andrew. Does that chime with your view? Absolutely. I mean I think just to start with the, with the last point first in terms of anchor institutions, we talk a lot about stability and about building confidence. Um, and I think that, that in a period of, of quite serious flux right now, at national level and at local level in terms of uh, economic geographies and the innovation architecture that underpins them, um, I think that kind of anchor role is more important than ever. Um, we'll talk a little bit more across the course of the webinar, I think, about about the kind of direction of travel in terms of devolution and about the separate roles of local enterprise partnerships, combined authorities, the transition from the RDA model to this slightly more bottom-up business focused uh, and collaborative piece. Um, but I think one of the most important things to, to sort of take away is that the collaborations that can be forged through this process are actually one of the most lasting assets and one of the most important sort of stable pillars that can be taken forward. And I think uh, NHS actors locally need to play a huge role. Excellent. Thanks, Andrew. As I say, we'll, we'll come back to many of these issues today and throughout the series of webinars. Why are the NHS Confederation and the Smart Specialisation Hub interested and involved in this agenda? Well, we're both national partners, and I think we both 
have a role and see this emerging landscape from our own perspective. Uh, and I think it's really important that we nationally come together to try and help provide local areas with the, the guidance uh, and, and some of the some of strategic understanding to help underpin those local relationships. So, so that's a, that's why we are uh, working together on this on this partnership. Uh, and really, this is about innovation, looking at the health landscape. So critical to us in particular is, as Andrew just mentioned, how we get the NHS around the table where it, uh, where it should be helping decision making uh, locally across institutions, across areas to try and influence development. Uh, so, so this is why we are doing this and bringing these webinar series to you. And, and we want to hear from you as well, actually. So do get in touch with us at some point uh, if, you know, if you think there's an issue which we need to, to raise in this. Um, does that underpin from your side too, Andrew, in terms of what smart specialization means to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, I mean, first of all, in very general terms, I have the smart specialization hub, and that's a term I'll explain in a second. Um, we spend a lot of time out and about traveling, supporting labs, supporting science innovation audit consortia, again, about which more later. Uh, apologies for these slightly confusing terms right at the top of the, uh, of the webinar. Um, but what we see is that, is that things are really only informed. Innovation models, innovation practices, and, and projects and strategies are only really informed by the people around the table. Um, and certainly when we go to these sort of larger consortium steering group meetings for, for science innovation audits, um, one of the things that, that's so markedly apparent is that there are absences there. There are people whose voices aren't being heard. Um, and I think that if you're really to have a very bottom-up informed approach to innovation, you need all the major actors uh, around the table. Uh, speaking of bottom-up approaches to, to innovation, um, that's essentially what smart specialization is all about. Um, the smart specialization hub was formed in response to, in part, a recommendation in Sir Andrew Whitty's review of universities and growth, um, and the Smart Specialization Strategy for England that government published a few years ago. Um, and the hub is essentially designed to support local innovation actors, um, to support applications for European Regional Development Funds under uh, innovation axes, to ensure that the right projects go through, and to make sure that we can provide uh, evidence-based support for the right projects. Um, there's also a degree of advice to government in that as well, feeding into the industrial strategy, for example, um, and helping them with their place-based understanding and intelligence, and trying to make sure that, again, we convene the right innovation actors around the table. Um, it's called the Smart Specialization Hub because the principle of smart specialization, um, which is quite hard to say over and over again, even after several coffees, um, is essentially around bottom-up understanding of where um, a local area of innovation strengths might lie. So. It's about focusing on what you're good at. It's about backing up what you're good at with data. Um, and it's about ensuring that you make the right decisions with the right people, again, around the table um, uh, to plan ahead, essentially, and to make sure that you're able to uh, empower yourself to access the cross-cutting technologies of the future and really prepare yourself as a local area for the next five to 10 years um, to make sure you have this kind of resilience in your local economy. Um, and it's really about people coming together around those goals and, and understanding the data and analysis that informs those decisions. Um, it also was, was very prominent in informing decisions around funding uh, through the uh, European Union. This is obviously a need that is now um, somewhat in, in flux, so we'll, we'll see what that takes us. But the underpinning rationale is still relatively sound, and uh, certainly the information that we try and share with people, um, we find it still has a lot of value. And, and I think you, you, you raise an important point when you referenced uh, the EU uh, funding streams, particularly structural funds, uh, European structural investment funds, uh, which of course use that smart specialization policies and underpinning. And I recall at the time uh, being the NHS representative on the smart specialization board, which was looking at the, the key sectors uh, to focus on for ERDF spend in particular. And, and you know, we were successful in having health identified as a point. And, and I think at the last count, I'm due to uh, somewhere in the region of 25 to 30 million pounds worth of ERDF projects which involve the NHS related to health innovation, which is clearly a success story. And I think we might look ahead to the success of to ESIF at, uh, later on in this, uh, in this webinar. So you've heard about why we are interested in coming together nationally on talking about this agenda. What are we going to do about it? Well, very simply, uh, this is the first of a series of webinars running on a monthly basis until March 2018. 
looking at a range of individual areas, but all linked underneath the banner of innovation and local growth. These webinars are free for all. They will be recorded. The presentations will be made, made available on the website there. Uh, please do pass on to colleagues or get back in touch with myself or Andrew afterwards if there's any issues in particular which you want to, to look at in more detail. We thought we'd start with a quick counter through what we would call the local growth agenda. So if we go back to 2010, I know it feels a long time ago now, uh, but Andrew's mentioned uh, regional development agencies. The coalition government took a very early decision, actually, uh, that this one-size-fits-all economy uh, with perhaps an over-reliance not just on the South East but on financial services and individual sectors uh, wasn't working. Uh, for the whole country, and they wanted to start the shift of economic powers away from that centre, away from Whitehall, to actually underpin local economic planning. And so what, uh, post RDAs, of course, it was the advent of local enterprise partnerships, or business-led, non-statutory bodies underpinned by uh, local governments uh, as, as a statutory authoriser, I suppose you would say, in most places. Uh, let, since then, how has that shift manifested itself? We've seen a raft of city deals. Uh, I think we're on about 35 or 36 city deals now across the UK, where literally, as the word sounds, deals between the Treasury and the cities uh, of the UK. Uh, we've seen a raft of local growth deals, particularly in relation to those structural funds, which we mentioned, where let's at the forefront of, uh, of accessing uh, different financing routes uh, and I'm sure many of the local growth deals touch on innovation, use innovation as a, as a, as a key part of that. And, and actually, you know, we've also, of course, now arrived at devolution deals. So this element and this understanding and, and, and use of the deal is not going away. This use of the Treasury sat around the table with local leaders is clearly how the government wishes to try and underpin local decision making. Uh, I think what's really interesting within that is this increasing localization of fiscal policy too, which is not just about giving people uh, the powers, but the tools to do a to do a uh, to make local decision making on a long term, on a, you know, on an economic and strategic basis, uh, which they feel is best for their place. So it, it's a really interesting agenda. Quite often it might have passed the NHS by in parts. We had our own white paper in 2010, which, you know, which has had uh, long-lasting implications. But actually, as the place develops, it's incredibly important that the health service understands and is a part of this place. Now, we're talking about innovation today specifically. And uh, I think, Andrew, you were actually uh, along this graph. You were actually within biz at one point. Uh, so it might be interesting just to, as, as we look at this chart, mm. to go back to perhaps where the government saw innovation policy mm. on the left-hand side and how that in itself has evolved. Yes, absolutely. The, the exalted deliberations of ministers. Um, absolutely. I think um, this sort of, I mean, the devolution agenda was set in train a long time ago, of course, and, and people holding holding the levers and then also having the access to the funds to, to sort of pull those levers in an effective way um, is uh, is increasingly apparent. But I think what was what was going through government government minds collectively at the time was, was a little bit around, yes, local places need to have the, the rights and responsibilities to make their own decisions, but they also need to have the intelligence to do it. Um, and by intelligence, I mean information, data analysis, sort of underpinning rationale that can really make what they do robust. Um, and I think the idea of having low enterprise partnerships rather than RDAs was fundamental to this kind of innovation decentralization idea where you would really have bottom-up business-led where, where necessary um, and local actor-led focuses in on um, what what people were really best at uh, for the application of those levers, which has happened over over time, I think it's fair to say, and, and certainly nothing was was really settled in those first couple of years as the left started to embed themselves. Um, but what's happened since then, I think, is, is that we move away from that slightly um, uh, kind of ad hoc approach where everybody's still sort of, sort of dipping their toes in the water and working out what they're good at, to getting on the front foot a bit more um, and starting to really examine sort of what they're good at and really planning both as local areas and also in concert with, with neighboring local areas or other people with whom they can partner because let's not forget this is quite a small country um, and if you want to partner with somebody outside your geographic economic unit, why shouldn't you, frankly? 
Um, but it was about understanding the sort of um, where you were strong, effectively, and then and then evolving towards having the, the tools at your disposal to act on that. Um, and I think government's view of innovation in that context, and that government view of innovation is a word whose definition changes over time according to who's using it. But but I think government's view on innovation in this context was really about um, making sure that innovation could be in the hands of those who could enact it rather than rather than sort of central sort of top down actors. I would also say. Um, uh, just sort of in that kind of context, that as a country, we've never actually been particularly good at knowing what we're good at and where. Um, and some of this sort of devolution agenda, some of this sort of um, uh, devolution of powers and of tools and of funding, goes with sort of hand in hand with this idea of taking responsibility for identifying what you're good at in a robust way. Um, and that's how I think we've evolved over the course of the last seven years or so into a position where combined authorities, where, where metro mayors, where local enterprise partnerships should really now have a really good handle on what they're good at and they should really have the right people around the table to make sure that they can stand that up. So I think that's, that's been the journey, to be honest, and I think that's, that's sort of where we find ourselves now. Thanks, Andrew, and that takes us nicely on to the next slide, which really does reference that maturity of the place, which you mentioned. And, 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 and what is interesting about this agenda is the place is, is the only point at which the strategies we are all working to in our in our own sectors actually meet. And what we have on this slide are just four chosen strategies which will be uh, in existence in some parts of the country, four of them, in some parts less than that. But actually these are critical strategies locally. We have, you know, every LEP will have a strategic economic plan and, and you and the Hope Andrew will be, you know, playing a central role in those. Of course, if you have a new combined authority deal, you'll be, you know, your investment plans will be a major part of those, and they may well touch on med tech or life science or digital health. Uh, we'll come back to the industrial strategy coming out because I think that's a critical alignment potential. And of course, with my NHS hat on, everywhere in the country, uh, there is a sustainability and transformation plan or, or now partnership. Uh, and, and I think what's interesting is how innovation cuts through the STPs, uh, and it should be an important part of that. And I suppose, from your perspective, uh, Andrew, my, my question is, you know, you, you, you often, you will be dealing at the top end of that list. I suppose, ha have STPs come across your path? I can't say that they have, really, no. Um, and I think that's um, partly a function of, 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 sort of the kind of engagement that we do. Um, but I think it's also partly because, in some cases, LEPs, combined authorities, and so on, maybe aren't necessarily giving them the prominence that they might deserve. Um, and I think there's probably a, a sort of two-way lens through which that can be changed. Part of that is, is greater involvement from, from local NHS actors, I think, and part of it is a greater and, and deeper understanding of the vital local role of NHS actors um, by the economic units in combined authorities. I think that's really important. And again, it sort of brings us back to this sort of um, getting everybody in the mix, getting everybody sort of um, in the same room and having these conversations and making sure that there's something that's quite such a fundamental part of, of the local economy as the NHS, um, and its sort of uh, local impact, um, are being taken into account in the right way. And the one which we will come back to at a later stage is this industrial strategy, uh, Lincoln. You know, one of the future webinars will be about the industrial strategy. And this, I mean, I suppose it, it's worthwhile just saying a few words about it now, Andrew. We're expecting the white paper after the budget at some point, to be a really important document. And, and, and how that transpires at a local level seems to me a critical pivot point for that alignment of the different plans we're talking about. Absolutely, absolutely. I think um, one of the cross-cutting uh, vertical pillars, to use the language of Whitehall, um, in the industrial strategy we, we, we've come to understand is place. Um, place is one of the most fundamental things. Um, it's, it's sort of a fatuous truism to say that everything happens in a place. Um, but unless you take into account the sort of place-based elements of, of your innovation activity, you really don't really have anywhere else to, anywhere else to go. You can't, you can't focus on these things at a national level. Um, I think um, as part of place, we have to acknowledge the rebalancing agenda that, that the government will be pursuing, probably quite rightly pursuing, although you can talk about different ways of doing it. Um, Ensuring, I think, as was Michael remarked before we before we sort of came on air, um, uh, that it's not really a zero-sum game economic rebalancing. 
Um, and it's really a question of um, uh, making sure you can empower local areas to really take advantage of the excellence they have within their borders. Uh, and that there is an opportunity here to, if we get strategies right, uh, and if we get our targeted investments right, to create high and medium GVA jobs across the country um, and, and look to really start to fund absolute excellence, yes, but also relative excellence. Um, and it's about identifying and servicing that. The National Industrial Strategy will look to do that, but it will also look to empower local areas to do that too. So you're seeing uh, local enterprise partnerships now looking to either refresh their strategic economic plan. Um, most of these original documents were published in about 2013. Um, so there's definitely work to do to bring these up to date um, and to really reflect on what, what modern strengths are and what the future might hold, especially in the context of Brexit and the other architectural changes that's taking place. Um, but a lot of local areas are also looking to evaluate their industrial strategies um, and uh, several are holding fire until in fact the national strategy is published so they can take some, take some sort of guidance from that in terms of how they can go forward. It's a really good time to start talking to your LEP, your combined authority, anybody who's involved in the development of a local strategy, um, especially one that will be triangulated and reflected up to national governments because this is where the decisions start to get made. Um, and this is where we start to have real conversations about what's being prioritized and what comes next. So I think there is this sort of, this is prism here through which we understand strategy and it's, it's a word we bandy around quite a lot. Um, but it's about sort of light being refracted through that prism as I stretch this back towards breaking point, um, <laughs> reflecting two directions nationally and locally. And I think uh, at any level in which you can engage um, will we'll help to sort of move the needle a little bit. I, I completely agree, Andrew. And I think on that, actually, what's really in interesting and important for the NHS and all important for NHS partners to know is just the value of health as an investment. I mean, it's 10% give or take of the economy and in, in the wider health context. And I, and, and I don't think you'd write off 10% of the economy as a cost. I think it should be seen as an investment. And in, in any local area, in any part of a SEP, or in any part of that industrial strategy alignment, many different areas which the health service works on should be taken into account. We've highlighted research innovation today and in, in, uh, across this webinar series, but these conversations should be taken into account uh, and in association with conversations about workforce, our estates, how we tackle social exclusion, and of course that local supply chain and local expenditure. And every local economy is different, so you know, it, it might be that the nature and value added of the health service to your local economy on innovation differs across England, and that's appropriately so. And it will differ in different areas. And I think what's important, as you mentioned, LEPs and that maturity of place and holding a mirror up to yourself and challenging yourself on what you are good at and what you do well, but also having a difficult discussion about what you don't do well yeah. and where your focus might not, uh, where your focus might not uh, be placed. And, and likewise, the NHS should be a part of those conversations, in particular in those, uh, in those areas there. I would say there's definitely um, um, a locus, a sort of long-standing locus policy-wise um, to get uh, sort of innovation in, in, in sort of health and sort of related subsectors um, really near the top of the agenda. I mean, even if we go back to the government take great technologies, which were, were um, we don't really even talked about quite as much yeah. now, but these were uh, enabling technologies that, that were, were essentially um, designed to be prioritized and, and taken forward nationally. Um, and I think one of the earliest ones to be established was the life sciences, genomics, and synthetic biology, um, enabling technology, uh, or, or great technology rather. And I think um, I think that kind of impetus, that kind of um, uh, that kind of rationale hasn't changed. It hasn't gone away. It's just become slightly more tightly focused and, and, and zeroed in a bit more on, on where individual places can make their own contributions. And I think, and, and just evolving that too, I think there's been a, a bit of a more understanding about actually the difference in, in, in health innovation, it, it was very much life science as a catch-all. Yes. When we go back to original LEP strategies, Andrew, is that fair? And you know, you put your 39 then LEPs in a room and you were an expert in life science at 39 hands yeah. went up. But yeah. actually, yeah. I, think, I think that Absolutely. understanding from both sides has evolved. I think so. As the maturity of the importance of the place has, has taken shape. I think that's absolutely, absolutely right. And I think actually there, is, there are ways in which some of these classifications are now slightly unhelpful and a little bit clumsy. Mm. Um, I think that it's a little bit too broad brush for us now. I won't go into sort of the, the, the boring nature of six codes and applying those to, to uh, innovation data sets, but it's certainly um, we need to perhaps 
you know, certainly at national level, people like us, but maybe we need to think a little bit more sensitively about some of the nuances. Yeah. But anyway, that's it for another day. <laughs> another webinar. Yeah. We're now just going to let Andrew lead us through a few uh, a few slides talking about the hub mm. uh, and try and help us understand more about the world and how we can work with it and how we can use what the hub uh, provides to help us locally. So Andrew, do you want to lead us through these next few slides? Absolutely, yes. Um, what I would also say right on the start is that there is some duplication here in terms of some of the stuff that thematically Michael and I discussed mm. earlier on here. Um, so I don't really plan to go through slide by slide and, um, and sort of uh, lead anybody by the nose through it, I'll say that. Um, what I would say is that um, the local growth agenda, as it says on this first slide, is, is moving very, very quickly in a very dynamic context. And I think we have to look at it not just in terms of the devolution timeline that we spoke about a few minutes ago, but also in terms of the prevailing context. So Brexit obviously is the, the huge elephant in the room here. Um, and, and potential shifting, choking off, and, and reintroduction, perhaps in different form, of the funding streams that are associated with the European Union, how we deal with that going forward. Um, in terms of research and innovation, uh, as a sort of general thing, um, the innovation support structures that will sit behind um, innovation funding and things like that are changing radically. Um, Innovate UK, the UK's innovation agency, uh, higher education, education funding council, for England, I will get it out. Um, and, um, and other bodies. We're all working towards now UK research and innovation, um, which will be kicking off in, in April of next year, with an overhauled remit with a lot of challenges to try and solve, um, and uh, and trying to reconcile this idea of place and excellence, and rewarding uh, excellence, whether absolute or relative, um, and trying to use that to create the greatest additionality for the economy. So there's an awful lot going on. Um, the environment, as I say here, is, is, is very challenging indeed. Um, places are very much where innovation happens, because places are where everything happens, frankly. Um, as I say, it's slightly asinine to observe, but it is true, and occasionally national government can tend to forget that. So we have to be have to be quite sort of quite sort of robust in making sure that, that people in places are empowered to make these kind of decisions themselves. The hub itself, um, I touched on this a little bit earlier on, um, we were set up to provide this advice to local areas and this validation service, as it were, when they were trying to develop strategies and individual projects essentially trying to help them demonstrate coherence with, with sort of overarching strategies and, and kind of, um, to, in, in, to an extent, sort of a national kind of um, kind of set of ambitions which were set out in the Smart Specialization Strategy for England, but also to focus in really essentially on, on what they were and what they were best at, which is, again, something we keep coming back to, but which is incredibly important to remember. Uh, Michael referred earlier to the um, uh, left hand shooting up and everybody saying they were good at the same things. Um, I don't think it's telling stories outside of school to say that a lot of the early strategic economic plans from 2013 um, were quite voguish and they did focus in on the kind of things that, that seemed to be popular at the time, so graphene, things like that, um, when it wasn't necessarily the right thing for a local area to be pursuing. Um, there were other, other sort of ambitions that were much more achievable and could have a much greater rate of return, but because certain things seemed to be national priorities, there was a sort of a sense of me too. Uh, and I think we at the hub um, and other organisations are trying to get local areas to move away from that and consider a little bit more what they what they should be should be good at. Um, what we try to do in the pursuit of this is we've put together an innovation data set which maps the innovation assets of all 38 labs as it is now um, across a series of publicly available innovation indicators. And this is available on our website, which is going to be on the slides when when they go up after the uh, after the webinar. Um, what that tries to do is to give a sort of baseline understanding of where innovation assets lie and where local areas are strongest. It's the first attempt, really, we think, to do something like this on a national level. Um, we're also expanding it to uh, cover the rest of the UK, actually, so we should be able to publish uh, updated information for Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland next month. We hope, but, but more on that, more on that later. Um, this is the kind of initial evidence base from which we can make recommendations for decisions to be to be made. Um, either locally or nationally. Um, it isn't the be all and end all, certainly, and it, it helps us to really start conversations around where gaps in data exist. But I do think that it does help people to convene around the idea that, well, hang on, look, we're good at this. What can we do to leverage that? Uh, what absorptive capacity do we have to really maximize this? Where do we need to consider our, our, our skills resourcing or, or things like that? Where do we need to consider how our infrastructure or ability to cluster and, and, and have grow on space uh, in, impacts this kind of thing? And these are all very general innovation points, and Michael will, will bring me tightly back into health related things very shortly. Um, but um, well, I'm really interested. I mean, it's, you've 
fill that space, which is an incredibly increasingly important space between the national government and its one size fits all voice and the local elements with you know potentially dozens of different voices coming back and you know, I wonder you talk about your data sets and, and the tools you're coming up with. Are these ideas you've you've developed you've developed yourselves or they concepts which national government wants or what people locally are asking for? How do you understand what you can usefully do to help drive that thinking locally? I think the outputs are a function of that tension you just described, the needs of national um, and local and the sort of the need to kind of um, lens between those two things. Um, so I think what we've tried to do is design something that is useful to, to government when it looks to try and um, make decisions or get some low-level intelligence on, on, on local strengths, um, and for LEPs and other local actors when they look at sort of where the opportunities might lie. And it can work, you know, from, from, from lots of different perspectives. I mean, if you're um, looking to invest in a particular locality, for example, in a particular sector, it helps you to understand that there's capacity there to, to not just uh, sort of absorb the investment, but, but develop it and, and there's capacity there to to really continue to grow um, and I think this is the sort of a very early stage um, exercise in making that a reality um, one of the things we also need to try and understand better is the sort of the physical and human geography of places yeah. and I think that's something we can talk about another time yeah. but, but it's certainly a complicated um, um, set of challenges with which to work one of the drivers for, for uh, the collaborations that we've tried to support uh, has been the science and innovation audit process, which Michael, I know you're, I know you're aware of. Um, government, uh, in I think November 2015, developed uh, the science and innovation audit process, which essentially invited local actors to come together under the uh, umbrella of consortia, identify what their innovation strengths were, um, and to develop um, a document and a forward plan for essentially putting together um, uh, a kind of a strategy for really exploiting um, uh, these strengths and making sure that they were they were they were funded, supported, and, and well thought through. Um, there was an underpinning piece of data work that went with that, um, and what you started to see is consortia would come together around different sort of sectoral uh, axes and, and determine what they were sort of best at. And this this came from from certainly from universities, from from academic actors, from researchers, uh, from local business, and, and, and people like that. Um, and it's been very helpful for us to get these people around the table and to start to have these conversations and start to convene these people, um, tell them how their, their sort of nascent plans fit strategically with national goals. That's really important, I think. Um, sitting on the steering groups, sharing the data that we have that might be of, of use, um, I think that's been incredibly helpful. Uh, and that helps us to reflect upwards as well. It helps us to inform government and let them know that these things are happening um, and are quite sort of um, uh, quite vibrant. And, and, really some thinking going on on the ground. Um, this, I mean, this helps us to feed into the industrial strategy nationally, of course, as well. Uh, and the audit process has been actually one of the sort of um, drivers for this webinar series, certainly from, from sort of my perspective, I don't know about yours, Michael, is when I was sitting around the table at one or two of the um, science innovation audit steering groups, I ran into a couple of uh, NHS actors around the table. Um, certainly the, uh, the lead situation MedTech audits um, there was some sort of feed in there, and the Oxfordshire Transformative Technologies, Technologies Audit as well, which was another uh, pretty big collective. And it made me sort of ask myself, why well, I wasn't seeing that elsewhere more frequently, and, and perhaps wondering whether it hadn't been communicated well enough, or if it sort of there was this sense that it wasn't really for people to come and sort of participate in. It was very much an invitation-only kind of club, or like a pay-to-play, or something like that. And it seemed to me that the Seeing the contributions that were being made and, and, and sort of the direction of travel was being set, um, and thinking, well, hang on, there are people who aren't here who perhaps should be. Um, and I think it sort of it was one of the kind of drivers for us, kind of taking this forward and thinking about where some of these opportunities might exist and how we can perhaps do our best to sort of put some scaffolding around them and, and make them more accessible to people. And, and those those lessons are incredibly important across borders too. I mean, you know, as you say, what you're talking about, Andrew, is people and sectors and institutions being conspicuous you know, by their absence. And actually, I think sometimes that's quite difficult locally to understand who should be around the table at the right time. Uh, and sometimes, for example, our, our, our boundaries, you know, our borders, you know, our geographic borders, uh, you know, are, are where we start and stop. And I think your helicopter view of these 
I think is really interesting and important in, in just trying to get different sectors to understand the importance of coming together. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that coming together is so important. Um, one of the things that's most um, uh, apparent, I think, certainly from the audit process, is that people really value the lasting collaborations that emerge from it. Um, there's, I have one in mind in particular that I won't mention by name, but perhaps can when we touch on these things in future webinars. Um, above and beyond just producing a document and a strategy and a set of recommendations and funding asks, they keep meeting. They keep coming together. They keep identifying future priorities and, and, and looking for, for ways to ways to really animate this kind of agenda for themselves. They're really important connections. Some of them are personal. Some of them are, are, are sort of more organisational. But these decisions really get made by the people who are who are there, who are present to make them. Um, and I think, yeah, I keep harping on this idea of having the right people around the table. But it's it's until so you actually see it happening and you actually sort of see the vibrancy of some of these conversations and, and as people start to say to each other, well, why didn't we talk about this two or three years ago? Because we hadn't met two or three years ago. This was the lever that, that, that brought us together. Um, it's, it's quite inspiring to see what can be accomplished with the right people. I think that's a really important message as, as core demands within a sector are incredibly difficult and, you know, and, 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 and typically coming up to winter now. It, 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 it's another reminder that the transactional approaches are not where gaining the extra and the added value are from. It's, it, it, it's properly embedded local relationships which are critical. And I know you've got some yeah. um, some final points which, again, we've only mentioned a bit about you, but yeah. you wanted to look at here. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, but I'll just sort of bounce off what you just said there just very quickly about we have a tradition in this country of having quite a linear innovation model. You know, you, you come up with an idea, you, you put it together, get the right people to, to implement it and commercialize it, if that's the direction of what you're going. Um, it doesn't necessarily happen in, in quite the sort of robust, sort of like rough and tumble, everybody in together, everybody challenge everybody's assumptions kind of way. Um, and that's really important. It's, it's, I've had it likened to sort of this muddy pond where everybody just sort of dives in and, and grapples with the big ideas. Um, and everybody has a big enough voice to be able to, to eventually, through what can be quite a painful process, um, put together a coherent program that works for everybody and that leverages all the opportunities and all of the assets to hand. Um, and I think that's sort of that's one of the most important things um, to, to not get locked out of this process. Um, I think it's it's um, especially given how formative everything is right now at local level. This is exactly the right time to be getting engaged. Uh, as I said in the, the, the slide here around collaborating around innovation, um, uh, health will always be an innovation priority. Uh, Michael's made reference to the uh, to the vital sort of um, uh, economic benefits uh, in sort of in all kinds of ways, and I think this sort of uh, the ancillary benefits are as important as any other. Um, but it's about really bringing some of that to life um, and making sure that the strategies that are being developed aren't being being developed and implemented solely by universities or as anchor institutions or, or um, local businesses as anchor institutions and their supply chain. What I thought we'd do now is just have a look at some of the future uh, webinars uh, as they as they go forward, uh, Andrew. And, and the one next month of, of which we can register, people can register now, which is taking place on the 23rd of November, is looking at something you've mentioned again, which is science innovation audits. And I think we've just had a new wave launch, a third wave. We have. And, and, and I think we've almost had total geographic coverage now of, of, of the country in terms of what FIAs mm. are. Almost. <laughs> almost, not far. Yeah. And, and I suppose there's that sense about, and what we want to cover really, the challenges, what are they? What is their value? What should I do? And what does it mean afterwards? Absolutely. And I suppose they're the four golden questions that run through my mind. Actually. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, no, we'll certainly be covering that uh, that in the November webinar. Um, but I think certainly for, for sort of um, top lines, just to sort of uh, try and whet the appetite for something quite a long and, 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 and sort of um, obfuscatory name. Um, the audits were essentially an attempt to get bottom-up intelligence um, and to effectively put together strategies that will drive both place-based innovation and sectoral innovation. Uh, essentially, it's, it's bringing people together around a collective set of ideas um, that, that they can be strong at a certain thing. And I think what's quite important and valuable about them is that they weren't limited to lab geography. You could look outside your lab, you could have um, uh, contiguous or non-contiguous um, audits, and 
the northwest, you have the Sheffield City region and Lancashire Advanced Manufacturing Corridor, um, which took a very sort of um, uh, a practical view of where where different actors and different contributors could, could really play a huge role and shape the geography around that to an extent. And I think that was quite interesting and quite informative. Um, you've got, again, we talked about Lee City region, which is a medical technologies and quite tightly focused sector really there. Um, some of the ones announced in this third wave have open innovation at their heart um, and, and their geographic sort of aspect is, is, is sort of of a piece with their sectoral focus rather than one being suborned beneath the other. So I think it's really interesting that, that this is a real chance for people to, to think about things really with a blank sheet of paper and just think, well, hang on, what, what can we do together here? What, where are our strengths? Who wants to come around the table and identify what those are? And turn that into um, perhaps pitches for funding um, perhaps coherent strategies going forward. Um, I mean, certainly there is there is um, a role for government, I think, in taking these, these documents that they've commissioned um, and, and using them to inform their own decision making. So it's certainly, I mean, if government is thinking about where to situate forms of investment or, or, or how to allocate, for example, the Shared Prosperity Fund, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about in future webinars, um, if you put in the science innovation audit, um, which, uh, which identifies that you're strong at a particular thing, then there's far more chance of government looking at that and thinking, well, hang on, there's evidence here. There's evidence yeah. to underpin placing investment and resource here. Um, the audit, um, as you say, we've got, we've got wave three, which was announced by, by Joe Johnson a couple of weeks ago, um, amongst a host of other announcements. So if, if you pass people by, <laughs> I'm not entirely surprised. Um, they may well yet be, um, be a wave four. We're not sure yet. Um, but certainly the list of, of, um, of, of audits that are currently being put together is up on the gov.uk website, and we can certainly circulate. Um, the web address for that in advance of the next webinar. And um, essentially, if there's an opportunity to play in, we'd be more than happy to help um, anybody who wanted to sort of get access and be, be introduced to the right people in those in those audits. Um, we are close to some and getting closer to others, so, so certainly we're in a position to support along those lines. Um, and I think, um, yeah, sorry, I have nothing. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll also be joined with uh, with Nick Scott Ram from Oxford HSF, who's been involved in the in the SA. You, you already mentioned that, and I know that Nick's got some particular insights in this. And I think it'd be really interesting. I'm looking forward to this webinar because it it boils down to that what you mentioned about well, the now the, the now what mm -hmm. is related to actually what you do locally about it. Yeah. And I think that's perhaps this evolution we're seeing, which you know, Whitehall, you know, the centralised approach of Whitehall to really. You have this innovation audit, and it might matter nationally, but it really matters locally. Yeah, exactly. And you know, and the question of now what is not just a national one; it's a local one. I'd be interested to hear Nick's reflections on that, actually, and on the experience of, of, of becoming a part of the Oxfordshire audit, and certainly how he went about accessing it, whether he were invited to join or, or whether he sort of yeah. forced his way in. I don't know. <laughs> but certainly, it's um, uh, it's it seems to have worked out positively for all concerned. Well, I, and you're absolutely right. How to get that seat around the table? Do you, do you even know about the table? Yeah. And the meeting? yeah. And I think these, these are questions which we will we'll certainly ask Nick. And then in December, so we're expecting industrial strategy. Would you say late November, early December, Sir Andrew, or would you expect some slippage there? Well, well um, do I expect slippage, or do I expect to be surprised by an early release? I don't know. Um, at this stage, the, the kind of the word on the on the on the street, that street probably being Whitehall, um, <laughs> is is around the autumn budget. Budget, as I suppose you must call it now. Yeah. So that's late November. Um, it wouldn't be um, a huge surprise to see uh, some of the announcements sort of split between kind of each these documents, as you would expect. And, 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 and in fact, if you take life sciences, for example, we've had the, uh, the life sciences strategy, and you know, as you say, yeah, well, uh, the sector deal looks like being the first one of the five sector deals referenced in, in the green paper to be wrapped up. Um, and, and I think. It, you mentioned, you've touched on it before. We throughout the, this webinar, we, we've had that understanding of excellence, yes, but, but place now. And I think how how sector deals and place bear out in that white paper will be, I think, a fascinating mix. For me personally, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Then. Absolutely, very much so. Um, it's one of the things that um, uh, UKRI, which is obviously another another of the, um, uh, the webinars we've got coming up, uh, one of the things UKRI are going to have to grapple with. Um, the idea of balancing sector and place, I mean, excellence and place, rather. Um, and the sector deals are, are an interesting topic as well. I think um, what's going to be especially interesting is watching 
the sort of emergent technologies try and coalesce around a sector deal and try and put together some kind of um, coherent leadership function. Mm -hmm. That's going to be really interesting. And certainly there are implications there across across sort of health subsectors, I would say. I think there are lots of different um, uh, opportunities, but it's about, again, who's around the table. Really interesting, and, and you mentioned UKRI. Mm -hmm. We've spoken again throughout this webinar about the change in governance, and UKRI uh, becoming uh, will exist as an official uh, body for, from April next year. And so, in January, we will speak to colleagues involved in setting up the, the, the shadow organisation. And, and again, the, the UKRI strikes me as being a or the big player in the future innovation landscape, Andrew, would that be your perception? Absolutely. Uh, the ambition of UKRI is to become the, uh, the best innovation agency in the world, um, which is you know, a, a small and easily accomplished <laughs> ambition. I'm sure they'll wrap that up in the first couple of weeks. Um, but, um, but to do that, it, it, it's, it's really it's going to have to talk to everybody, and it's going to be grappling with so many early issues. And we talked about this linear innovation model earlier on and, and how we can sort of move away from that to involve more people. Um, how do we encourage um, uh, sort of innovative processes to transfer from some industries to others? And that's huge implications there again for, 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 um, uh, for areas of, sort of the health sector and so on. So I think there's so much to try and try and manage here. Um, and I think when you factor in the development of the Office for Students, um, which is going to have uh, some implications for, for certainly researchers and universities across the country from a regulatory standpoint. When you talk about the Higher Education and Research Act, which is going to have again its own its own sort of um, uh, uh, challenges for, for, for the research establishment and our HEIs, um, there's a lot going on, and this is what this sort of the, the soil into which UKRI is being sown. And um, it's going to be really interesting to get some insights, I think, and, and discuss between ourselves and, and, and between any, any sort of uh, listeners and attendees exactly what those next steps are going to be. I think. You've mentioned the changes in the university sector, and I think it's, it's so important that we understand reforms are not just affecting our own sector. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and, and it's very difficult in the sector, and you know, if you were to speak to a colleague from local government, a colleague from the NHS, a colleague from the university sector, they would each speak about their own challenging sectoral mm -hmm. circumstances. But actually, we need to understand, I think, the difference and how the different sectors are working because you know, this, this landscape is changing. And, and that brings us on again to February 2018 webinar, which is about the governance of innovation. And, and again, a, another common and incredibly important issue. And you know, we're, we're seeing what many people will call a patchwork mm -hmm. now, as devolution takes a foothold in some places. We now have statutory combined authorities. Some places it might seem to be uh, moving to a unitary yeah. authority. It might be changed in local government. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, what we want to look at, uh, and I know this is to which you know which you're interested in too, and to which is how how will these changes affect public service reform and the innovation priorities we're making as sectors to try and help provide and drive that public service reform. And, and this strikes me has been such a complex landscape. Yeah. And if we can bring, I suppose, any <laughs> any light into it, 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 it. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, yeah, it's, it's got a few months yet. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, I think the governance is, is something which often we ignore, perhaps because when you work nationally, it's still that one size fits all. Yeah. And you know, and we're still in our own sectoral silos sometimes. But but how things are working differently and how things work at different speeds and what that means to me and my institution Excellent. is incredibly important. And, and the March two, uh, 2018, rather, uh, uh, we're not going to keep you waiting a year, another <laughs> year for that. It, it's looking at the funding which. We've mentioned uh, the success to structural funds, uh, the uh, shared prosperity fund. Uh, we, we will look at things such as local growth funds going forward. The industrial strategy has its own challenge funds. I think that sense about what the future lies in terms of devolved funding and who I need to work with to access it will be will be really the forefront of people's minds. Yeah. We'll have a lot more clarity then. Um, on the design of, of, uh, of some of these, certainly the shared prosperity funds, and, um, and where management of that fund might lie, uh, how it might be accessed, what kind of activity it'll look to support, um, and the extent to which it's going to look to pursue the rebalancing agenda. So I think this is all super important stuff. Um, and by March 2019, of course, we'd have a lot more. Um, <laughs> well, it might not be quite useful. Um, I wouldn't jump to that conclusion. <laughs> no, no, no. 
And one thing actually which is interesting there is, and we will cover this in the discussions actually, it's no longer the case that there's a clear need for some of these issues. Yeah. Not It used to be the case you could up to your, you know, you could reference which government department, for example, mm -hmm. was in the lead, which team within a government department was in the lead. And, and, then, <laughs> and the complexity that we're feeling locally is, is also there in a white hole, which of course Brexit is, 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 uh, is, is taken a hold of. So actually, some, you know, hopefully some of these webinars will also try and understand, help us understand some of the complexities nationally, yeah. which we're working in locally. And, and this is the final slide with our details, and, and, and you know, it's been in about 50, almost almost an hour today. It's been a, but this today's been an informal introductory webinar, uh, and I think we've covered what we hope is the background to the local growth agenda, how that is affecting uh, policies and strategies and sectors which we are used to working in with our own institution. Perhaps that sh shone a bit of a light on why things are changing. Uh, I'm really looking forward to some of the forthcoming uh, webinars because they'll be far more specific in their themes. But but these are our these are our details, and, and you know I'm sure I speak for Andrew here when I say do drop us a line, tell us how it feels yeah. locally on the ground. Yeah. If you would like uh, uh, to discuss some of uh, the the tools and activities which Andrew referenced, if, if you would like a visit or to, to meet. Then likewise, please drop us a line because I think you know what I've taken away, Andrew, from this is is actually it's it's going to be difficult, and if it's not difficult, it's probably not the right conversation locally. The, the, where we are locally, there's a mature system is different across England. The issues we're discussing are different yeah. across <laughs> England, and actually, there's no one size fits all. What gold standard looks like. Absolutely. It, it, it's diffuse, it's dynamic, um, it's asymmetric, certainly. I mean, I think you talk about variable capacities across the country, that we can take that to the case in point. Um, there are labs that are, are, are quite large, um, and quite well staffed, and, and it's generated from their own sort of resource. Uh, and then you have some which are, are doing a lot with, with, with comparatively less. Um, some of that areas, of course, are, are um, large economic units, and others are, are, are sort of less large. So we're, sort of, we're comparing apples with different varieties of apple, I guess, <laughs> um, to an extent. So there is going to be variability, and you'll be pushing either at, at doors which open very quickly, or those which perhaps are very hard to find in the first place. And I think that's the thing. We can signpost quite well to where these doors are. If it seems quite sort of high level and helicopterish at this early stage, mm -hmm. it's because that's kind of where we are right now. Um, and uh, if people get in touch and want specific assistance with very, very tightly focused specific things. Well, thanks for joining us. I uh, hope you found that uh, useful and helpful. Uh, you've got our details there. Uh, registration for the next webinar on the 23rd of November, looking at uh, science and innovation audits, is now open. And we will keep you uh, abreast of uh, future webinars on their exact date, so you can put them in your diary. Thank you for joining us, and have a good day.